Right. Marvellous. I think we're getting there. I think that's I've pressed enough buttons there. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining. This is our second Meshwork webinar of the week, as it happens, following on from Sarah Price yesterday. Um, for today's session, we're joined by architect Seb Lomas. Seb is an expert in sustainable design and policy, contributing to industry initiatives to decarbonise construction. He has been a coordinator for ACAN in the past, um, co-authoring a report on decarbonising construction, developing the networks, strategic direction and coordinating multiple national campaigns and legislations. Um, I think it's safe to say right now that there's a limited use of the building performance evaluations being used routinely on projects within the construction industry. As a result, new homes often fail to meet low energy targets and consequently fail to satisfy residents on areas such as ease of use, summer comfort and energy costs. With the UK striving to meet their goal of achieving net zero by 2050, BPE will help developers to calculate more accurate energy usage, as well as make homes more comfortable and enjoyable to live in. Um, but what is performance evaluation? And also, what is building performance evaluation? And how can it help developers within the construction industry? So hopefully, Seb, I'm sure they will, um, Seb and Meshes Doug Johnson will be able to answer this question. Um, before we start, can I politely ask, everyone seems to be, um, just leave your mics on mute, but please use the chat function. Um, please use the chat function to introduce yourselves, ask any questions, say why you're here. This session, as you might have heard right from the start, is being recorded and we'll slightly edit it and then upload it to Meshwork and YouTube um, in the coming days. I'm just going to launch a poll as well. Um, Seb's very interested to see who's actually has experience with BPEs. So I'll launch that now. So if you could um, answer that poll, that'd be fantastic. Thank you. Um, so that should be live now. Um, yeah, so Doug, Seb. Let me stop sharing my screen, Seb. And then, in fact, I haven't even started sharing my screen. I didn't put the slide up. But um, if you would like to share your screen and bring up your presentation, then, um, yeah, we're away, away we go. Thanks for joining us today. Thank you very much, Simon. It's great to be here. Doug, did you want to um, uh, start off with anything before I start sharing? No, I don't think so. Um Go for it. Morning, everybody. Uh, I hope you guys are all uh, guys and girls are all well. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, if you if you crack on, what we'll do is say, as Simon said, use the chat chat function to throw in some questions. We'll um, it depends how you want to do it, Seb. Really, whether you want to rattle through the presentation, whether you want people to as questions come up, try and answer them. Uh, we, we we'll obviously leave try and leave uh, time at the end for questions and a kind of a more open discussion. What's your preference, Seb? For um, questions from the attendees if anyone uh, feels if there's anything that needs to be clarified as we go i'd say feel free to heckle um otherwise <laughs> okay. there will be otherwise there will be time for for discussions at the end so um yeah happy. okay so you've been you've been, you're allowed to heckle that's um that's oh, yeah so it's giving you permission to heckle so Absolutely. we'll see how the heckling goes if it gets too out of control we'll leave it to you. <laughs> And, and have you seen the results for the poll, um, Seb? There's um, no, I haven't. Please right, read them 67% out. Sixty-seven percent of people have said that they understand BPE well enough to explain it to clients and colleagues, um, right. and seventeen percent have undertaken a structured BPE for a project. So that's really useful. Thank you very much. That's really appreciated. Great. Okay. Well, I'll, I'll dive right in. Um, again, thanks. Doug and Simon uh, and Mesh Energy for inviting me to talk about this today. Um, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I know that it sends quite a few people to sleep, so that's my challenge for today. Um, so today I am going to be, uh, you know, it is going to be an overview. I'm going to go into some examples of uh, what we've done. Um, so I'm going to start with uh, why we do it as an industry. Uh, then I'll go through what is BP. Um, I'll then share some lessons that we've learned as a practice from doing it over 12 years. Um, and then also uh, the different ways in which um, architects can offer it um, to clients. I should say, this is obviously coming across from an architect, um, but it need not be an architect who does BPE. I think, especially in certain aspects, there's huge value of having non-architects doing it. So I think it's just about understanding your uh, training and your capability in order to offer suitable, suitable scales of uh, BPE. Um, and also partnering up with others to have a more complemented service. And then lastly, I'll close with some, some guidance uh, from the industry for further information. So um, this, 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 this provocation. Um, 
like in general, post occupancy evaluation has been the historic reference term. Um, and more and more, there's the uh, use of the phrase building performance evaluation. Uh, what I like about BPE is it obviously puts greater emphasis on the idea of doing the evaluation um, throughout the project stages, um, uh, rather than just waiting until you've inverted commas handed over a building um, and then and then just looking at it at that, at that point because obviously by that point a lot of the damage has been done and it's a lot harder to have uh, engaged conversations with the design team to, to rectify things as quickly as possible. Um, I did kind of put the provocation to Twitter a while back to ask which people thought was the right approach and it, uh, like right terminology and in general people feel that BPE is, is better um, and some people still like to use POE when they're actually just doing stuff on a building that has is, is in operation which I think is an interesting take on the two. So First section, why, why should we be doing this? Um, disclaimer, I'm not an expert. I'm an architect by training, uh, but I have been doing um, post occupancy and other evaluations since my part one. Um, and I'm sure there could well be people in this call who have got more experience than I. So as I said, I do welcome uh, any kind of corrections or heckling or uh, anything like that, um, because I think it's really important that everyone's open and transparent about our own limits of knowledge. So why should we be doing this in the first place? Um, our uh, managing director has got a, a, a great uh, philosophy that you know we absolutely need to make sure that our buildings work. That's an absolute paramount uh, before before anything else. So BPE enables us to close the leap uh, loop between um, our intentions of buildings and what happens on the ground, but then also in its purest form, we can use it uh, between buildings, e either for the same developer or client, or um, just within the practice to make sure that we're making continual learning. And we're, we're committed to doing this on as many of our projects as possible. And interestingly, there is an explicit obligation uh, of chartered architects from REBA to inform clients of the benefits of this evaluation and to offer it as a service um, where they're competent to do so. And I would highly recommend every architectural practice to develop uh, an evaluation process for their buildings that they're able to offer. Um, and interestingly, architects declare also call for competent architects to include it in their base scope of works. And we've we've been doing it for several years without any litigious repercussions, which we're, we're, we're proud of. Um, and the fact that it represents that we, we have an extended care of, over our buildings uh, because we absolutely want to make sure that they are doing what they do. And the unique data that we get back from all of this is an integral part of uh, developing our own evidence-based approach to the low energy buildings and healthy spaces that we're able to deliver. So the performance gap, I'm sure you've all heard about this and you've probably seen the uh, Innovate UK finding that uh, in a, on average for non-domestic buildings, they exhibit a two to 10 times uh, performance gap between design intent and energy use on the ground. The graph that I'm showing is actually by a different university study, which, which uh, it was to illustrate the fact that when you go for passive house, for example, not only do you reduce the holistic energy being used, but also you uh, almost exclusively design out the performance gap. And the performance gap is one of the significant reasons why the operation of buildings in the UK represents 27% of our national emissions, which obviously needs to be designed down and out if we're going to firstly keep within the forecasted capacity of the electric UK grid uh, as everything moves to electricity and also to align with our 1.5 degree pathway. And BPE is also about the commissioning process. As I was saying, it's, 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 it's less good coming in once the job is done. It's always better to be involving it uh, during the commissioning process, uh, working for a fluid handover from the design team to its unit users so that they understand how to maximize the, all the things that we put a huge amount of effort and time into designing um, and making sure that ultimately when the users take the spaces they're happy and not besieged by building faults and system issues and we, we so for example we, we were doing evaluations on schools at the moment and there was an anecdote from one school um, that due to poor commissioning uh, during the first winter there was no heating and the school had to bring in calor gas burners into each of the classrooms just to keep it at a, a, a usable temperature uh, which I just think is unacceptable. So another reason is uh, continual learning about the uh, improvements about how we design and specify our buildings. Um, obviously, unlike the car and phone industries, the con 
construction industry is notoriously poor at learning uh, between building to building. And um, we're absolutely uh, all falling behind the curve where it comes to learning from our mistakes um, and also our successes in identifying them. Um, so for example, we found out from some of our early evaluation that um, window actuators are highly, highly vulnerable um, and uh, can easily lead to malfunction, which leads to poor ventilation and CO2 concentrations in academic space spaces. And sometimes these uh, consequential uh, impacts go unnoticed unless they're uh, monitored. And I think, and this is something that always has fascinated me, the, the variance between how we intend buildings to be used as architects or designers versus the performative reality on the ground. And I think that it's hugely valuable just to observe that that difference to inform ourselves as designers uh, and ultimately to inform uh, future brief writing on projects and, and how we interpret those. So what exactly is building performance evaluation? I think you might be able to summarize it by saying it's learning about how our buildings work to inform improvements in their own use and to improve uh, to inform improvements in future design. So um, what's I'll talk about the British standard in a second, but what's very positive is it sets out a kind of step-by-step -step roadmap for, for how to do it. Um, and there are various ways, uh, mechanisms or activities, some of which are in order to gain uh, qualitative feedback. So this is a photograph from an example of a workshop we were doing with user groups in the schools. Um, this was 25 teachers during their break time, and we were assessing a, a, a number of questions to them and also all of the other stakeholders uh, across a number of schools to get qualitative feedback, which we could then use uh, to inform our evaluation. Another very key part is uh, qualitative observations. Um, so we undertake this by doing walk walkthroughs of the buildings, uh, observing them in the life of a typical day in the school to observe the difference between user needs and the expectations and allowances that were, were, were in included within the design. And ultimately, this highlights how robust a design is to the alternative use patterns that emerge over the building's life. Then we have quantitative feedback. Um, so we do this via questionnaires. Um, you can set your own up or you can use the building utilize, uh, uh, utilization survey, which Arab manage, uh, which is an example of on the left. Uh, the benefit of that is you are able to benchmark it against the uh, national database that they've been collecting for, um, I don't know, well over a decade, probably two by now. Um, there's a license fee for doing it each time, but it's useful to be able to represent that ben benchmarking. Uh, on the right are some examples of um, outputs from uh, online surveys that we set up ourselves. Um, and what's beneficial about them is they allow you to substantiate or challenge uh, findings from the workshops. So users might be saying one thing, but then actually when you go to a wider group um, and ask them to respond uh, quantitatively, um, you come back with very different findings. They're also really useful for comparing uh, between schools. Uh, the example on the top right is showing um, staff satisfaction of the acoustic performance of their classrooms between the two schools. And I think you could uh, very easily see from this that it's very much chalk and cheese. Similarly, the, the graph in the bottom right is showing how the staff feel the school's provisions support agile uh, teaching. Um, again, between those two schools, you can clearly see which is, uh, which is uh, more successful in the client's perspective, sorry, in the user's perspective. You've also got the opportunity to do quantitative observational analysis. Um, this otherwise goes by the term space utilization surveys sometimes. Um, and what you, you set up a, a, a pattern, you can either do it in person by doing a route and you record the number of people and their activities in a space every hour on the hour for a week during the normal week of a year. Or you can do it electronically by using um, uh, occupancy uh, sensors. Um, and what it does is it highlights the specific times and locations within the school or building or campus where utilization can be improved. And it is incredible when you do this process, just how low uh, utilized spaces can be, despite staff maybe saying that things are absolutely filled because they think about one moment as opposed to over, over the whole period. And then you've got the environmental and energy monitoring aspect, uh, which is a very, very valuable quantitative output. Um, ideally, this should be done over a 12 month period as minimum um, across a range of metrics, which I'll talk about later. 
um, it can be remotely managed. Um, we have developed scripts for processing it uh, quickly because um, you accumulate a lot of data. And there are some standards such as SIBC TM22 for, for undertaking it. Another uh, important component of uh, building performance evaluation um, can be thermographic imagery. Um, and we can use this to further our understanding of what's going on in spaces. Um, but it's important to, to understand what you're getting from a thermographic image um, rather than solely relying on the images and understanding that you know, things like airflow have a, a, as much of an impact as well as thermal co conductivity of the fabric itself. So until last year, um, there was a gap in uh, standards for those who wanted to be undertaking uh, building performance evaluation, um, which I think was part of the reason why there was a lack of uptake and action. And I hope that with the uh, new British standards, uh, there will be a greater confidence in clients about what they'll be getting from those who offer uh, these services. Um, so uh, until last year, we've got Bizria's soft landings on the left, uh, which is which is very powerful um, and uh, predominantly focusing about the initial handover process and making sure the building users are well briefed about the spaces and how they should be using it. And it does have a financial mechanism for uh, remediation issues. Um, and the SIBSI TM22 on the right-hand side obviously is, is much more focused about energy. So last year, British standard for building performance evaluation um, was launched. Um, and it was phrased about BPE rather than POE, which I think was very positive. Um, and it very clearly sets out three plus one, uh, three, three levels or scopes for undertaking evaluations uh, with the option to then tag on uh, what they dubbed investigative um, evaluation components onto any of those three for specific things that you might be interested to learn more about uh, on a building by building basis. And it doesn't replace uh, the soft landings methodology. It is much more about um, evaluating what has happened and what could be what could be improved, rather than trying to smooth out the the process of the initial handover. So I think there is uh, merit in in uh, in both in in con in uh, not in parallel, one after the other. Uh, but the British standard has got a very broad base for its uh, analysis, which I think is really positive. Uh, which does include uh, energy to, to an extent. But if you haven't had a look at the guide yet, I hugely recommend it. It's been written by passionate people from the subject, um, and it's a really, really useful user guide for, for setting out uh, what should be included in all, of the, in all of the different aspects. And as I said, I hope that uh, through the standardization, uh, there'll be an improved reputation of what's, what's being offered and delivered to clients when they when they do evaluations, which will only help more happening across our buildings. So this is just a screen grab. Um, as I said, for the three uh, levels of evaluation, uh, it sets out a scope of works effectively. Um, it breaks it down interestingly into three categories, um, whether you are doing a uh, one building, uh, and, and in which case you've got more to be doing for, the, for that one building. Um, if you are doing a cohort of buildings, for example, a university campus, um, you can actually do a, a lighter scope of work for 10% of, uh, sorry, for 90% for of the cohort. And then 10%, you then have to go um, uh, more, uh, uh, more thoroughly through the scope. Um, and there's also an option if you're doing uh, base buildings only, which is if you are doing uh, tenant, tenant aspects or of a shell and core uh, development. And in the British standards uh, suggest that it is best for this to be done by an independent person from the delivery team. That need not be from a different company, um, just it's beneficial to have the uh, impartiality uh, of an independent person. Uh, and the standard sets out that that person should have a sufficient skill set in order to be able to do this thoroughly. Um, it's absolutely vital to communicate to your PI and insurers about uh, undertaking this. Um, there is a perceived risk from insurers, uh, so it's really important to have a, an open and clear dialogue with them about how, how those risks are going to be managed through the process. Um, 
And positively, the authors of this British standard have said that they're actually going to be reviewing it within the first two years of its use. Typically, standards are reviewed after five years, but they appreciate uh, the importance of uh, making this as robust as possible. So uh, there's an open opportunity through the Building Performance Network to uh, input any kind of feedback, positively or negatively, about the use of the standard um, you know, in the next 12 months. Um, so this is just a workflow that I've, I've mocked out from the British standard. Um, the standard doesn't, uh, it doesn't illustrate this. So I think there are options for considering some of the sequencing of things, but ultimately it suggests you start with a project commencement briefing with the client to make sure that they have a robust understanding of what they're going to be getting from it. What are the key areas of research that you're going to be focusing on? Um, and then it's very useful there and then as or as quickly as possible to have a, an initial walk around of the building, ideally with someone from a senior uh, senior position um, to be able to get those first glimpses of the buildings and how they're being used. Um, the British standard, I believe, then suggests that you should be doing your online questionnaires to be getting that, that broad basis of feedback. Um, if, you, if you do the questionnaire at that point, the benefit is you can use the findings to then inform the questions that you're using at your occupant workshops. Um, but the other way around of doing it, I think, is doing the occupant workshops first, uh, which allows you to gain a huge kind of uh, wealth of knowledge. You can then do your observation day and work uh, walkthrough, and then you can use the, the questionnaires to ask targeted questions, which you can then get a broader um, feedback from. So I think, uh, I personally, I think there are different ways of running it. Um, and similarly, the British standard uh, suggests that you do your observation day and walkthrough with the design team there with you so that you can ask them questions about things that they come up and you can uh, it's 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 more it's more interlinked. I think another way of doing it is to to split them out so you do your observation day independently. Um, and the benefit of that is your you can be a bit more discreet about how you you undertake those observations and spaces rather than a, a large group of people and you have more of a freedom about what you might be focusing on when you're evaluating things and then following that up uh, or proceeding that with uh, an independent uh, design team post construction review um, which is really really valuable and then ultimately that informs um, report writing um, sometimes it's on a quarterly basis or an annual basis depending on what you've agreed with your client so I'm just going to go through some examples of what we as a practice have learned from doing uh, evaluations over the years. Um, this was one of our uh, very early primary schools, actually. And um, it was before we as a practice had actually committed to Passive House, but we were uh, drilling into the performance of our buildings and we were really keen to learn about why things weren't quite working as we anticipated and what we should be considering on future projects. Um, and interestingly, a lot of the findings from this um, kind of highlighted to us the, the benefits of, uh, of what Passive House would be offering to us. So we actually did this with Innovate UK and TSB funding. Um, and it was part of, of, of a pool of buildings that were being evaluated, which it, it, performed, it performed very well against, uh, even though it wasn't actually Passive House. Um, it used a TM22 energy analysis. There was a there was a walk around of the building um, on an observation day, and we used the bus survey, which I mentioned earlier, for doing the benchmarked findings of user satisfaction, and it identified some some actions for uh, improving uh, projects in the future, but also this project itself. So, uh, one of the outputs was to create a classroom user guide. Um, which uh, it's so surprising how rarely these are done on projects in the industry, but um, to, to expect that school users and teachers just understand all the systems and that you know that things that which, which can be uh, frequently too complicated will just be done correctly. So these are uh, these were after the evaluation they were designed with the users to make sure it was going to be clear and concise. Uh, and then they were printed and uh, applied in all of the classroom spaces in perpetuity so that, you know, no matter how the handover for new staff goes, they will all, always have that information. And this was uh, driven by that when they did the initial evaluation, there were some really high CO2 levels in the classrooms. Um, and after having done this, uh, and the usage of the spaces improved, um, heating was only required uh, two hours a day. Uh, in order to keep within comfortable boundaries. 
Um, this is an example of some, some research, which was, I think, absolutely phenomenal. It was done in 2014, 2015, um, with a partnership between UCL and Archetype, uh, led by our colleague Chrissa. And uh, it encompasses our very first generations of passive house schools. And what this analysis, uh, they put in some VOC sensors and all sorts, um, CO2 monitors, temperature, humidity. But what this graph is showing is the difference in CO2 concentrations between uh, the gray line up at the top is a conventional 1970s uh, primary school. Um, the green uh, line, which is the next one down, was uh, a, a Willow school by ourselves, which was pre-passive house. Um, and then in uh, yellow, you've got our first generation of passive house in 2011. And then the blue, you've got our second generation of passive house uh, buildings in 2013. Um, the red line at the top is the max limit allowed uh, for CO2 parts per million uh, within BB101 at the time, and then the dotted line down at 1500 is is the uh, the, the limit for the average CO2 concentration. And uh, I I first saw this at FutureBuild about seven years ago. I I was absolutely amazed by uh, firstly how how shockingly a 1970s building was performing, but also how it demonstrates the um, reduction, obviously on the graph through going to passive house, but also how much we as an industry can improve between the generations of our buildings uh, by improving and understanding how they're actually performing, um, which I think is a really nice um, story about the continual improvement that can be achieved uh, by introducing a high level of rigor into projects. The Enterprise Center uh, for uh, University of East Anglia is a structural timber building uh, for higher education. And it was agreed at the offset that the whole team would uh, be retained for three years beyond practical completion to undertake a very rigorous soft landings process, but also a building performance evaluation uh, methodology. And this set up quarterly workshops throughout the whole um, design period and also the three years post, um, which uh, operated as an early warning opportunity um, to optimize the building during that process. And as I said, this was built in from the project offset, which is essential to de-risk it so that all of the design team are uh, on board and committed to uh, the requirements of it. And there was also a safeguarded financial pot for rectifying any issues. And what this did was it created a safe space where people didn't feel it was a name and blame culture, but instead it really was an opportunity for holistic improvements. Um, and the proof in the pudding is in the data. Um, we're really happy that this year uh, the building achieved its seventh consecutive um, deck A energy rating, um, which is a really uh, powerful in illustrating that you know, through the commissioning, uh, the performance uh, as intended has been able to be safeguarded uh, rather than straying, straying off as use then uh, increases or changes. This is an extra excerpt from the Energy People Buildings uh, book, which I've got in my reference slide at the back, um, just showing that before the um, subtraction of the renewables, it was below the 2030 target for non-domestic, which uh, we were very happy with. And as I said, um, we've been doing this for about 13 years of our buildings. Um, and th this is just a snapshot of some of the work that we've done in partnership with academic uh, institutions, which can be a really useful way for uh, funding it, but also enabling uh, um, a greater uh, degree of scrutiny than what might typically be included in some evaluation levels. Um, it's been a brilliant opportunity for our own designers as well to observe the spaces that we have designed and used, which I think uh, doesn't happen nearly enough. Um, we also undertake evaluations on other designers' buildings, which is which is equally powerful, um, be it for uh, you know expanding our own understanding of opportunities and what could be done in the spaces, um, but ultimately it, it helps how we design the next building. I think. Uh, those uh, on this call will probably realize how BPE kind of ties into Reba 2030 climate challenge and um, you know being able being able to submit these low EUI figures that we're all aspiring to now um, you know a, a robust evaluation process helps us design out the performance gap gives us access to that information that we then want to be submitting and, and disclosing um, it's obviously really important to communicate to clients that uh, ultimately, as designers, we want to be disclosing this information. So, um, for example, we we incorporate in our client care letters 
uh, the clear expectation that we will uh, want to be doing that at uh, in due course um, so that we can um, show some examples to the industry and help the industry progress uh, in its in its understanding of data. So um, penultimate section, I'm just going to talk through how we uh, go about offering this to some of our clients and uh, the different ways in which uh, it can it can be offered. Um, as I said, uh, well, actually, I haven't yet talked about appointments, but there are three three of the options for um, delivering services. Uh, it can be done with a, in the original appointment if you're uh, appointed as a traditional architect. Um, and in that sense, typically the work would be um, limited to the 12 month defect liability period. Um, the other uh, another option is to have an independent uh, appointment. Um, the benefit of this is that uh, it can it doesn't extend the liability of the uh, initial appointment. Um, however, if it's done after the defects liability period, it can be slightly more challenging for the client to go about making any of the remediation. So it's more at the client's discretion as to how they would then proceed with uh, making any changes. Uh, and the, uh, another option would be to extend the original appointment. For example, if you wanted to do a five-year uh, evaluation process after uh, practical completion, uh, obviously that's extending your liability of the original appointment. Um, so PI insurers can be less 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 uh, keen to support this approach. Um, this is an example of some work that we were doing for City of Edinburgh Council on their some secondary schools. Um, the the council wanted to understand if there were any performance gaps in their schools, um, because they want to very much lead by example as a continual uh, learning and development of their own briefs, so that every time they commission new uh, schools, they are um, as informed as possible in that. Um, and these evaluations were uh, it was pedagogical, so understanding variants uh, between the. Uh, intended use of spaces and how they were used on the ground, but it was an also a, a full environmental and energy assessment. So we installed uh, an array of sensors, which we monitored over 12 months uh, and reported similarly on that uh, with some benchmarked uh, outputs. We did reports for each of the schools ind individually with regards to the, like, the observations that were made. And then we had a fourth summary report, which basically set out all of the recommendations for um, the briefing of uh, future future schools. And we are currently just concluding a similar piece of work across three primary schools uh, for the same council. We also do uh, building performance evaluation as part of our uh, retrofit work. Um, there's been a huge rise in demand for retrofit work over the last 18 months, two years, and we've developed an benefit informed retrofit plan. Um, and this actually starts by using building performance evaluation to understand the existing assets to then inform uh, the expectations of what might be done, but also critically a PHPP model, which we then use to create the baseline, which we match to energy bills to validate the PHPP model. And then from that, we're then able to make design interventions like um, an array of them, which we can then communicate the opportunities to the client before they set off on their, their, their expensive project uh, program of actually uh, undertaking the works. And the for, to do this, we undertake um, opening up works, thermographic surveys, and uh, point cloud modeling and air tightness testing of the uh, buildings as part of an evaluation process to make that PHPP model as robust as possible. So for Plymouth Margin University, we undertook um, space utilization survey, which I, I touched on earlier. And um, there was a, a quite a quite a typical finding where basically that spaces were significantly underutilized when you look at a campus-wide picture rather than just the uh, the moments of highest utilization. Uh, and we were able to demonstrate that actually just by uh, careful programming of the spaces, um, uh, start, uh, student numbers could be increased by 50% without building a single square meter of additional buildings, which uh, I think is the highest value of building performance evaluation when it can be used to displace the need for a new building and in, uh, inform the brief writing. And our evaluation also enables data-driven dialogue, which I think is a really good way of communicating with clients very clearly. Um, I think a powerful graphic like this is very uh, engaging and can clearly illustrate the opportunities uh, from learning from existing buildings 
to then inform decisions for future buildings. Um, so uh, this analysis was undertaken using um, evaluation of our uh, of a couple of buildings of our own in use, but also the publicly accessible um, displayed energy certificate uh, databases that you can download, um, which enabled us to then make a very robust commentary about our own buildings against their own average building stock. Um, and the school in question that we're illustrating here, um, the third bar across from the left, is the example of the school in use during COVID. And the importance of that is that it had windows open. And, and even still, um, it was sign performing significantly better than the average and pretty close to its design intent, um, which I think is a nice uh, debunking of the myth that you can't open buildings in passive house buildings because you can and they still operate pretty damn well. Um, and then the last one on the right is a similar school uh, delivered at the same time of ours elsewhere in Wales um, in pre-COVID conditions, illustrating that uh, obviously that's uh, a lower, lower <laughs> EUI. We've also developed a online platform, um, which is really powerful. Uh, we did this using proprietary components from IA Think Solutions for networking sensors in our buildings. Um, and we can link these to a number of energy and environmental uh, sensors, such as CO2, humidity, light, sound, and uh, even occupancy. Um, and we use suppliers Alliot for the sensors. And we're using a, a, a number of different models at the moment, and we're learning from each one what, what's best for each, each instance. And collectively, we think that uh, marrying this with the other evaluation methods uh, really does allow um, architects to maximize the value that they can provide to clients um, once the building has started being in used. We use this also during the commissioning phases, um, and it enables our in-house experts to identify and troubleshoot emerging issues before they become too established or significant. Um, so by way of example, uh, a recent project of ours um, our experts were brought in um, to do 12 months of analysis during the commissioning process um, because the main contractor's MEP subcontractor went into administration before reaching practical completion. Um, so we used a whole array of sensors uh, to undertake some investigative um, commissioning work. And interestingly, it highlighted that uh, a hot water cylinder was running 24 seven. And just by identifying that one thing and changing the program, uh, we were able to save the client uh, almost 10 grand in electricity bills, um, which I think is just a really nice quick example of a quick win that these kind of sensors allow uh, very agile responses on the ground. And obviously the sensors that we put in are very much developed in communication with the client about what it is that they want to be learning from the spaces or what we think maybe from the workshops uh, it's highlighted a specific thing which then warrants further investigation um I, I mentioned earlier warning systems we've actually we use this in our own buildings which are they're non-passive house uh, buildings um and we use this as a feedback system uh and so we get email notifications that bing through when we go over a thousand parts per million or fifteen thousand uh, fifteen hundred parts per million to you know open the windows um which is also just useful for ourselves as designers to have an increased understanding about how these systems work so that we can talk to clients about them with more authority um, and also in Improving our own understandings about building physics uh, and how quickly you can purge ventilated space, but then also how quickly it uh, uh, cramps back up in CO2 as soon as you close the windows. This is an example of some of the internal air quality uh, monitoring and reporting that we're able to do through using this uh, platform. Um, and this is typically a, a longer duration piece of evaluation. And the graph that I'm showing here uh, shows an example of the percentage of time uh, of CO2 within certain bands. And what this enables is a more holistic uh, view rather than just focusing on the peak that might have happened for two minutes on one day during the, a 12 month period. Um, so for example, the uh, there's one classroom that was uh, quite frequently in the higher bands and the only one in those higher bands. And this evaluation led to some investigation to see that this classroom was at the end of a ventilation run. And so actually all that needed was some commissioning of the, the duct. Um, and when that was rectified, uh, it then fell back into the bands of the other classrooms, which interestingly um, goes hand in hand with our previous research about Passive House and the fact that when commissioned and done correctly, 
um, the spaces can all sit within very healthy CO2 bands. I just wanted to include this as well, because I, um, I believe that this building, um, they've paired um, occupancy monitors with a visitor's app so that when you visit the space, you can find out where there's a, a free desk uh, and then navigate to it. Uh, anyone who's used university buildings in London know how absolutely crammed they become, which I think is really powerful. And I'd love to see more, more projects and technology uses like this. So just uh, lastly, um, a few bits of guidance um, for those who want to find out more. Uh, these are just favorite books of mine uh, across the top left to right. Uh, Reba's got an array of publications um, and I'm, I'm sure they'll be probably publishing another one quite soon. Um, and lastly, the Building Performance Network is a really good resource for those who want to um, connect with experts and, and progress the adoption of these evaluations more. So at that point, I will uh, close my slides. I'm happy to take Cheers any up. questions. I'm, I'm very pleased to announce I've got at least a few of those final books on my uh, on my bookshelf. <laughs> so that, that doesn't make me feel too bad. I've only read a couple of them. I've still got a couple more to go. So yeah. You've got to be in the kind of the right frame of mind to just take in all the great content from them. Yes. Um, I, I, I scrolled down a load of questions there, but has anybody else listening in got any um, kind of questions for... Seb that are that are burning and they fancy uh, fancy getting answered. There hasn't been any on the chat so far. Sure. Yeah. Anybody? Uh, anybody want to want to pitch something else? I'll launch in with a few questions I've got. I I I thought. Oh, here we go. Go, on, Rachel. Hi, Seb. Hi. Um, great, absolutely great talk. I just wanted to ask a sort of um, scoping or sort of day to day question. Your diagram before of the route through the steps showed a couple of site visits, but in sort of in the best case scenario, if you're doing this over three years, how often do you think you want to be sort of going to sites, um, both to sort of check? I know you do a lot of Internet of Things and lots of your monitoring is remote, but um, for that sort of um, observational stuff, how often do you think you want to go? It's a good question. I think uh especially good when it comes to like setting out the scope of works and costing it all i think so we've done we've done evaluations where we've just done one day on site per school so that's what we did for the edinburgh schools and you know you can get an overwhelming amount of information from that and i think that can be suitable if you're just doing like one report of uh, the, uh like a quite a, a late appointment piece of evaluation work um I think obviously the limit with that is that you don't get the seasonal variations. And I think, so there would be huge value in at least going, you know, between and the sh shoulder seasons and then um, max heat and max cool. I think, I think that would be very robust for if you were doing a standalone report. Obviously, when we were doing the five and three year stuff with Enterprise, we were doing quarterly revisits and, you know, it was less of a kind of like full day necessarily. But I think that's really, really helpful. So I suppose I'd say if you're doing a multi-year thing, I think you should be going at least three times a year for those different seasonal variations. Uh, but maybe you can get away with a single visit if you're just doing a standalone, more concise report. Cool. Cheers, Seb. Uh, anyone else got anything to, to ask, Seb? One thing um, I, I thought of actually whilst you were answering that that question, Seb, was um, your your comment about the commissioning. Um, and we've seen this a huge amount, that the benefit of even, even just looking at a kind of electricity monitoring, let alone looking at CO2 and, and all kinds of stuff. It, it, it is, um, you know, once you've got that data streaming, very very quickly you can realize if there's something obviously obviously wrong obviously when you look at it through the seasons you can you can kind of pick up and and finesse the information but i mean your your example alone a ten thousand pounds saving just because an immersion heater was left on or something was set up incorrectly the couple of examples that we've cited from uh, more kind of domestic applications we're actually one in our offices here in in farnham another one for a client where it started a, a kind of a few years ago the client had been merrily it was their second home they've been merrily paying just paying the electricity bills uh and it dawned on him that he might be paying a bit more money than he should have done uh we put in some energy monitoring kit just just looking at electricity just kind of off the shelf something off amazon um a system that that we've got to 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 know really well and within five minutes of streaming data i personally put the system in within five minutes of streaming the data it was obvious again that the 
uh, secondary return loop, which is this route that you, this this loop of pipework that you put in to make sure you get hot water to bathrooms as quickly as possible, and it's kind of pumped. Well, that was being pumped twenty four seven, like it was just being pumped. Yeah. And the way that the system had been set up was when the hot water system temperature fell, and it was doing so quite rapidly, the immersion heater was kicking in to top it up before the, the air source heat pumps were kicking in. So essentially, he was heating his a fair amount of his home with electricity uh and 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 that was just a quick calculation meant that he was probably paying an extra 30 percent on his gosh yeah total heating and hot water bill for the house and he'd been doing that for two years and it was only when he kind of thought something wasn't quite right and within five minutes and and, and that client might have spent you know a thousand pound on 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 kit Mm. But within five minutes, we'd saved him considerably more more than that. And and even in our offices, we had somebody who was had a uh, she wasn't here at weekends. She um, she wasn't working at weekends, but she had a like one of these oil um, storage heaters on a a built in timer that came with the equipment. But that was just for a day. It didn't know what day of the week it was. So that was again just just very very simply measuring the energy usage of the building. I reckon that was um for the sake of a 15 pound you know like seven day pull pin timer we'd save 200 quid a year if i hadn't spotted that <laughs> again mm. i probably would have merrily just kind of paid the bills and so this stuff you, you know whilst you can monitor a, a, a you know a lot of these other parameters even just the simplest of monitoring at a mm. relatively low cost uh can have a big big impact uh and and you know Data, I think, scares a lot of people. <laughs> um, you know, not everybody's kind of ready to look at reams of data, but mm. I think it's 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 dawning not only on professionals, but the way that professionals deal with it and feed it back to the clients and the right clients that are asking uh, their, their questions are asking their clients. Uh, I think everybody can understand the power of it. We use data in so many ways to help us in other aspects of our lives, yet data is only really just kind of coming into making a really big impact on you know on the built environment and it's obviously yeah. it's nascent stages but this, the, the guidance seems to be really helping but also i think the way that we communicate how clients can help themselves or what the benefits of doing this seemingly scary thing is and and, and you know, knock-on benefits are, are great yeah it's a good point doug actually i think I think that's what's quite good again about the British standard is it it doesn't say in order to do a light BPE, you've got to do, you know, VOC, CO2, RH, temp, you know, occupancy. It doesn't say that. It says like you've got to do the bare minimum. You've got to do some en energy. You've got to do, uh, I think it's like 12 months energy uh, meter information. And the I think I, I my interpretation of that is because then they've got the investigative option underneath it. Mm -hmm. So you do that kind of high level assessment is the building within the right kind of parameter when it comes to EUI for that use type? Yes or no? If no, mm -hmm. then, you know, then maybe consider, okay, what might it be? Yeah. Then let's think about what kind of sensors we put in. Because mm -hmm. I completely agree. There's no need to uh, uh, to scare people away and overwhelm everybody with too much data. Mm -hmm. um, completely agree. But also I completely agree with how excitingly quickly you can start kind of learning from things. Um, I think for for practices just to buy some sensors that they can then cycle between buildings um, as like an, a, an initial outlay from an R&D budget is something that we do so that we can now put sensors into buildings even if the client isn't appointing us to do so. So we've mm. we've completed an office building and we're quite keen to learn about it. So we've put our mm. sensors in there mm. and all, automatically we were like, hey, hang on, <laughs> those external uh, like outdoor PM was like way too high. And then we're like, oh, there are some flus nearby. So now we're like investigating that. And I think it's really, really powerful just to allow um, practices to become more curious. Yeah, I, I, I was like, it's it's um, it, it's incredible. If you can kind of get your head around it, it's, it's great, you know, in the presentation, you know, just offering uh obviously showing what you've shown what you've done and, and showing how older buildings compared to, to new ones but but sharing some of those methodologies which maybe aren't quite laid out graphically in that way in, in these particular documents there's I've said numerous times I think the next the next kind of few years let alone to the end of the decade is is some of the hardest learning us as professionals have to do there's so much there's so much changing about the way we're designing the way that we should be improving um and and, and kind of bringing ourselves up to uh, up to speed uh, and obviously this is this is a uh, another element of it um but one of the other 
elements which may not be so obvious uh, with this data is the ability to we 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 would all like to think we're designing more progressive, more sustainable buildings, buildings which are fit for the future and, and generations to come. And particularly when it comes to schools and colleges and stuff, you know, we're we're designing buildings for the generation below us or a couple of generation, you know, below us. Those those are important buildings. It's one thing designing an office building. It's another thing designing a nursery school or a primary school or an infant school or a mm-hmm. junior school uh, or a college or whatever. Um, and so whilst we would like to think that we are, uh, you know, designing incredible sustainable buildings at, at various levels, it's kind of useless thinking that without proof. I mean, how how can we professionally, how can we show up to work and continue to say we, we're doing this incredible stuff without actually knowing we're, we're doing it? it? It's kind of the same, it, 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 you know, there's a lot of analogies that you can draw, but certainly... You know, for for our practice and me personally, you know, I, I would sleep far better at night knowing the data that we had back from the buildings that we were designing. If everybody had kind of done their bit during the project, were yeah. actually performing as as you know as designed, yeah, in the first place. I completely agree with you. I think uh, that transparency and being able to disclose that information to stand behind our buildings. I mean. I, th- I really love getting to work at Archetype now and being able to show examples where we've demonstrated that to clients and just giving them that sense of confidence that they're actually going to get something that says what it does on the tin, uh, which is just a scandal that the industry has got to the point where it has with that, you know, with that ten to t- two to 10 times performance gap. I've, I'm, I'm conscious Siggy put a question in the chat, which is quite an interesting one. Uh, she was asking, uh, how do you think BPE fits into the more holistic community engagement and even co-design? Um, See, please feel free to unmute if I've kind of interpreted this wrong. I think, I think that's where, like, uh, I think some terminology sometimes really gets in the way of this. But I think the greatest examples can be when you revisit either similar buildings by the same client or uh, or just others that you think can be really good precedents and undertake evaluation of those to then help inform the brief writing and engagement with stakeholders of the next building or project that you're going to do. When I was, uh, I used to work at Alexi Marmot Associates and we did lots of this for people like uh, um, Boroughs for London and LSBU and UCL universities. And they were really, really progressive in saying, okay, we've got a problem, not we need a building, we've got a problem. Uh, And you start by looking at the available stock and really drilling down into making sure that's used absolutely perfectly before you then consider building a a new thing. But I think, I mean, you know, architects are always, always good at doing precedent studies and research, but I think um, taking users to see those is a really valuable thing so they can visualize how the different spaces might be used. Um, But do do you want to unmute and ask anything more specific? Um, Yeah, can you hear me? Hi, Hi there. Hi, yeah. Um, yeah, no, it was more to do with uh, building performance, like circling it back into the beginnings of a project, I suppose, and um, a way of, I suppose, you have to sell things to, in the work you do with schools, it's more like councils, but especially in retrofitting works and stuff like that, stakeholders that are the owners of houses and stuff like that have to buy into a process as well, and how uh, taking that knowledge that you do from building performance evaluation into a process of uh, early engagement and community and co-design might fit in, if that makes sense, um, to kind of like widen the scope of um, like moving more into housing and that type of thing. Yeah, I mean, so I, I think I was saying at the beginning, like our kind of like uh, evaluation of our buildings absolutely is fundamental to the way in which we engage with you know clients full stop because we're always using the examples that we've learned from our last generation of buildings to mm-hmm. underline why we do what we do so i think and that that really helps with uh you know conversations like should you go for passive house or what level of passive house should you be doing or you know what's the value of certain material choices and you know timber and construction because we're always evaluating we can speak with confidence about knowing how well those things actually perform and i think well i know that that helps our our uh, pitching for more progressive aspirations with clients uh, and definitely gives them confidence that they're actually going to get uh, what they want so i think i think it absolutely goes hand in hand um the process of how you do that 
you know, either as a practice or a company, you're always doing that evaluation. So you've got a data set which you can always pull on in examples, or you commission specific evaluation as part of the briefing process, either of your own buildings or of, of, of relevant others. Uh, I suppose that's kind of what we were doing with LSBU and UCL. Okay. Great, thanks. Great, thanks guys. Uh, we're quickly running out of time. Any any last minute questions again that are, that are, that are burning? Otherwise we'll, uh, we'll, we'll wrap it up. I think that's a, I think that's a no. Um, Cheers, Seb. That's uh, that's great. As always, we'll um, get this video kind of sorted out, get it up on uh, on YouTube, and it will be able to to view uh, forever after after we've sorted that out for you. Um, it, this is an incredible subject, and you'll hear more and more and more about it. It's um, you know we're we're just kind of scratching the surface, really. And and a bit like Seb said, I would encourage you guys to have a play have a play on your own house have a play on your own office you know whatever it's going to be this stuff doesn't cost a lot of money um and you know domestic sensors or commercial sensors it's really just kind of getting used to what the data is telling you as opposed to buying you know nasa grade sensors for telling you this stuff you can start far far lower level so um do get involved um get into it guys as always a huge uh, thank you for your time and again a uh, big thank you to um Seb from uh, Archetype. Uh, enjoy the rest of your days and uh, we'll see you again here shortly. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks very much. Cheers. Take care.